Thank you for having me here today. I'm really glad to come and talk to you about climate change and how to reach the low climate targets. Um, let's see. So uh, what I'm showing on the first slide is a, kind of an official slide from the IPCC Assessment Report 5, on which I was a, a lead author. And um, in, uh, right now, I'm a lead author on a new report, which is uh, targeting 1.5 degrees. Um, as part of being on the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, we're supposed to go out and broadcast the results. So some of what was in AR5, I'm going to broadcast here, um, in, including how the whole procedure works in the IPCC. But for the special report 1.5 that I just returned from, it's not official yet, so nothing I will say is um, coming from that document or as part of the IPCC. Um, very important distinction between my own opinions and the opinions of the organization for which I do work for free. Uh, so let's see here. So first thing, I want to talk about the Paris Agreement. Have you guys heard? I'm trying to remember if anybody specifically mentioned the Paris Agreement here. What was in the Paris Agreement? Anybody know? There were actually many, multiple things to, um, decided at the Paris Agreement, three of which I'm going to discuss here. Does anybody know what the Paris Agreement was? All right. Right, it, it was based on voluntary uh, contributions, so nationally determined voluntary contributions here. And it was, of course, in, the Par in Paris that it occurred, and it was part of the, the COP21. Um, and so there, it got a lot of publicity, because what they actually agreed to in this was to keep, they have the goal of keeping the temperature below 2 degrees warming from the pre-industrial time. It's a, it's a very, very bold goal. Then you have volunteer agreements from pretty much all the countries to try to achieve that goal. But of course, the voluntary agreements were nowhere near enough to get to two degrees. So those two things are actually disconnected from each other in many ways. Um, and almost all countries signed, although now the US has pulled out, which would come into force in four years. So we have good company, which is Syria at this point. Um, there was another thing that um, decided at Paris at the same time which was actually to write the report that I was just at. And so this is a lot of text on this slide, but um, the uh, global warming of 1.5 degrees, the special report on global warming for 1.5 degrees. This is an IPCC special report on the impacts of global warming of 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels and related greenhouse gas emission pathways in the context of strengthening the global response to the threat of climate change, sustainable development, and efforts to eradicate poverty. So pretty much in one report that we're supposed to write in one year, I think we're supposed to solve the world's problems. Okay? So it's an extremely ambitious report. But it, is, it, it comes out of the Paris Agreement. And so it's one of the few reports that the IPCC writes that was explicitly requested by the countries. And so we're going to come back to that and, and think about the context of uh, uh, how uh, reaching some of these low targets, like 1.5 degrees. Um, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the experience of being in the IPCC. Um, let's see, I write it out here. So Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, you've seen a lot of slides that come from the IPCC. And it comes from a combination of the UN and the World Meteorological Organization. It's a science-based organization. And uh, basically, the, uh, the reports are written by scientists, international scientists. So that's why I was in Botswana. One of the, lead, the coordinating lead authors on the chapter I'm on is from Botswana. Um, and so she hosted us there. And the goal of these reports is to compile and synthesize all the literature in, in trying to get to 1.5 degrees in the context of sustainable development and efforts to eradicate poverty, okay? Again, just this huge mandate that we were supposed to assess. So this is actually a picture from the AR5, so there's more of us. There's about 400 people here. But these are all the scientists involved in these kind of reports. And so they, they are international there. And um, I'm actually back here. That's me in the little circle there. But um, so there's a lot of people involved in these reports, and um, they undergo you know, thousands of review comments by thousands of experts. 
and uh, they're written by scientists, reviewed by other experts, as well as governments. And that's why the IPCC, as a, uh, a, a science interface with policy, carries so much weight, is because there are so many scientists involved in the process. And it, um, all the literature assessed in these reports has to be in the peer-reviewed literature, so it has to be, um, have gone through already review. Um, again, I'm going to use IPCC results, but it doesn't represent any official IPCC position, and I'm not going to show any results from the in-progress uh, special report on 1.5. I pretty much have to make that statement at this point. Now, we've had uh, several of the um, previous speakers talk about future projections, but I want to give kind of a, um, a physical science perspective on what kind of choices we're making for the future. So right here, the, this uh, top plot is the radiative forcing, which just means how much things will warm, how much out of balance we are in terms of our energy balance with time. So right here, we have 1850 to uh, about 2005. So this is when we uh, switched over in the last report, the 2013 report. Then we have a bunch of different scenarios. And you can see they're really similar out to about 2040. And then we have, this one's kind of a business as usual. And then we have uh, this lower one here, which is a radical restructuring of the uh, economy of the, of the world. Um, and so this is really kind of the decisions we're making right now, uh, which, which way to go. Um, and the radiative forcing is pretty much dominated by the CO2, especially in the high scenarios. This is, we're really just talking about how much CO2 we put into the atmosphere and accumulates. And of course, you know, at 2100, it's usually what we think about for climate change, but there's going to continue to have repercussions out as far as we can think about here. Um, now, then you have uh, global surface temperature on the bottom, and so you know, if we keep going the way we're going right now, we'll see about 4 degrees C global surface temperature change. On most land regions, that's going to be about twice as much. It's about 8 degrees C. Um, and so on a day like today, you might think, not a bad thing. Ithaca could be a little bit warmer. but uh, of course, for tropical regions that are already warm enough, or if it's summertime temperatures, that's a totally different thing. We'd have to have AC here and things like that. So uh, 8 degrees C on a lot of land regions, that, that's a lot of temperature change if, if we do business as usual. So then there's been an effort to try to get down to some of these lower targets, and that's what we're going to talk about today, and some of the other speakers have talked about this before. So uh, Brian O'Neill presented the reasons for concern slide and talked a lot about uh, the uh, derivation of that. And um, this has to do with how low should we go? I mean, what, what's a safe temperature and what's not a safe temperature? Um, sometimes people think that because, say, the European Union or the uh, um, at the COPS, the, um, people have said that two degrees is a good target, that you know, if you're above two degrees, that's terrible, and if you're below two degrees, that's great. A and the, that's not the truth at all, right? A any temperature above what, what we're used to, what our climate's used to, has impacts. And in different places, there'll be an impact, say, you know, 1.1 degree above uh, the pre-industrial level, you'll have an impact. And in another place, you know, you'll have a different point at which you start to see big impacts. And so the idea that there's one tipping point, although it, it makes a, a lot of publicity in some regions, it's not really supported by the scientific literature. There, there's no one tipping point at all. Um, looking at the impacts, what we know is just things get a lot worse the higher your temperature is, okay? And so um, when we're thinking about the question of how low should we go, you know, one is how low do we need to go, and that's kind of as low as we can, right? That, that's really uh, because of the reasons for concern, as, as he outlined, and if people, talk, people have talked about the impacts of climate change, we want to be a, as little climate change as possible. But the other question is how low can we go, right? Because there's other consequences from the other problems we have besides climate change and consequences to our actions to try to mitigate climate change. So I, I would argue there's no one tipping point, there's no safe place or dangerous place um, uh, that we can see in the scientific literature, that, that overall the consensus is try to stay as low as you can. Um, so there's no safe level, 
and there's no one dangerous level. Um, if we think about where we are already, um, uh, here's, say, the rise in temperature from the observations, different observational data sets are put here. Um, uh, already, uh, th this one is from the IPCC. It's a little hard to read because you have to start down here about 0 0.7, minus 0 0.7 and go up. Um, but this slide from the Guardian using one of these data, set, data sets, I think, is a little more clear that we're already maybe at, at one degree. There was a little bit of a, a flattening after the big volcanic year, uh, um, uh, 19, uh, uh, El Nino year in 1998, and a flattening of the increase. Um, but since then, things, you can see that here, th things have started back up again, okay? So after the IPCC ended, the temperature started rising again. So this kind of flattening that you see um, the, some of the climate skeptics made a really big deal about it. And it, it's very funny uh, it, how sometimes people who are experts at something totally ignore something because they know, I mean, this is what the climate system does, is it increases for a while, then it flattens, and then it increases for a while, and then it flattens. This, this is just how uh, climate oscillations occur. And so the climate scientists didn't really understand that the public was not understanding that, that Climate change does not mean every year should get warmer. That totally is not how the climate system works. There's all sorts of feedbacks in the system, and you expect kind of nonlinear responses. And we had this uh, kind of flattening over this period, so we expected it to increase, and, and that's what we're seeing right now, unfortunately, is an increase in temperatures again. And we might be at about one degree uh, surface temperature change now, is what the best estimate is, if you look at only one year. But really, when you think about climate change, what we're concerned about is the mean change. So, you know, one year being w one degree above isn't quite climatological yet. You need about 30 years before you consider it climate, okay? So why does the Paris Agreement limit the warming to either two or one, at 1.5? It depends where you are in the Paris Agreement, um, uh, which temperature they're, they're looking at. Um, and there's a, there's a couple different reasons. Um, as uh, there's a really nice paper that I'm citing here goes into, um, and, and like I said, it's it's not because all of a sudden at two degrees there's a tipping point and everything's over if you reach above two degrees. That that's not why they chose two degrees. The science on that is not very good, but there is some evidence that temperatures in the last million or so years were within two degrees. So maybe that's an okay amount to be in. Okay, there weren't any big tipping points if you went up to those levels before, so maybe it's okay to keep to that level. Um, but it's probably more of a political decision. You, you think about the, um, the COP and the countries, they, they were probably just saying, hey, you know, we're at about 0.8, at, at that time they were about 0.8 degrees above pre-industrial, 1.5 seems aggressive, okay? But, so let's go for 1.5 or two. You know, three, that's so high, we need to crank it down, but you know, one, that's too low, we'll, we'll never get there, that would be unrealistic. So they kind of just chose something that was politically feasible and economically feasible. And the science behind it, some people have tried to justify it, but it, it's a little bit hard to justify science-wise from a physical science perspective. So that's, that's my perspective on it, and I'm, I'm taking a lot of these ideas from uh, this Knudy et al. paper. But it's really a political goal more than a scientific goal. And this is a slide that uh, Peter Hess showed in one of the first ones, just uh, showing that during, it's called the last interglacial, um, the CO2 levels were actually a little bit higher than during our pre-industrial, just because of the configuration of the planet and the feedbacks in the planet. And so we, people think that it was a little bit warmer than our pre-industrial, and that's where the two degrees in the last million years from ice cores comes from. So there's some evidence for that. All right, if we say that we actually really want to get to two degrees or 1.5 degrees, what do we have to do, okay? So the, um, the, there's kind of a nice paper here that shows a, a graph of what we have to do. So here's on the left is our annual global CO2 emissions, and um, you know, zero is here, and this is what we're emitting right now. We're at two, two, uh, 2010 to 2018. Here we're kind of estimating. This is what we have been emitting. So pretty much we have to peak emissions today, yesterday, and start going down with emissions, be pretty close to zero mid-century, and, and keep it down. 
And that's actually to, to get it to two degrees with 66% probability, you can never be sure. Um, if we want to go to 1.5 degrees, right, which is now a focus point because in the, the Paris Agreement, they asked for this report to, to tell us what we had to do to get to 1.5 degrees. We, we don't just have to cut human emissions. We actually have to start taking up carbon. So this is human carbon sinks. Sometimes it's called human carbon sinks uh, or net negative emissions. Um, but basically, we have to have some technology that takes CO2 out of the atmosphere and puts it away. Um, or, or, you know, alternatively, we have to do some kind of solar radiation management, which um, Doug McMartin talked about previously, okay? And it, there's a lot of issues with that, so I'm not going to talk about that anymore. So what I want to talk about is, is, can we do this? You know, what are the technologies available, and how, how fast can we get off carbon? I mean, our society is pretty addicted to emitting carbon. What can we do? So again, you know, the Paris Agreement, I've had people tell me, well, it's solved because they agreed to stay below two degrees. But again, in that agreement, they said our goal is to stay below two degrees and we're going to do X to get there, okay? And, and what they promised to do, and it's even in the Paris Agreement, is nowhere near enough to get to two degrees. It, it, there's not, not anything there. Um, and um, here's the text of, the, of it. Um, but uh, so they want to hold it to well below two degrees, or maybe to 1.5 if they can. Um, and the, the action is that each party shall prepare and maintain successive nationally determined contributions. So these are sometimes called NDCs in the next upcoming slides. But they're voluntary contributions from each, uh, each different country, okay? If you take those agreements and you start looking just in the short term, because that agreement only goes out, the Paris Agreement only goes out to about, uh, I think it's 2030. From here, no policy baselines are going to increase up here. Then, you know, the current policies we're trying to get down to about here. Already things that are in, in progress. But if you include the um, national uh, contributions, you, you can get down to, to here. But if you actually want to get to two degrees, you, you need this much more reduction, okay? And so this is admitted in, in the Paris Agreement that the, the, what they propose is not nearly enough, but hey, we, at least we got something. And, and there's no doubt about it. The Paris Agreement was a huge step forward. And it was, it, you know, the, if you look at the, the slide here, you see Francois Hollande, who is, of course, the president, president or prime minister, whoops, of uh, France at the time. And, and France did a huge amount of lobbying to get the Paris Agreement through. There was a lot of work going on before then. And the French were very, very proud to have succeeded in getting everybody on board for this agreement. And it was a huge success. But it is nowhere near enough to get to the goals that they set at the Paris Agreement as well. And then you think about that in the larger picture, right? Here, here looking at things beyond 2030, well, you still got to get way down in terms of your emissions, okay? So it, you, you got to turn that emission curve over to, to make it go down. And we need to have close to zero emissions after, after mid-century, and we need to already be switching our infrastructure over. So you just last week had a talk uh, about Cornell's Climate Action Plan, and what, what does Cornell promise it will do by 2035? Zero, right? Zero carbon emissions, right? And it's a great, great plan. And um, it, they really, a lot of it is focused on the power sector there, and, and that's, in a lot of ways, it's the easiest sector. I mean, it's a hard sector to target, but it's one of the easiest sectors. Um, and, of course, the transportation, they're going to move to electric cars. But I don't think the plan includes airplane flights by faculty like me going to Botswana, okay? And, uh, by the way, somebody does calculate the carbon footprint of each of those meetings. Um, but um, but th these are, th that's a lot of flying by faculty and by students to get here. I mean, to do the business of educating students, it requires air flights, too. That's a little more tricky. Then you also have the food purchases and other, other issues. It, you know, the power sector might be the easiest one, but it's, uh, it, it's the one targeted by Cornell. So they have a very ambitious plan. 
And if you look at their plan, right, a lot of it, uh, of our plan, it's earth source heat, which um, is a really ambitious plan to move us onto earth source heat. And, and what is that plan contingent on? If you saw her talk, do you know what the plan is contingent on? A lot of funding, okay? It's actually pretty expensive to do the air source heat. And I sure hope we can do it, and I sure hope we can demonstrate it's possible at Cornell, but it's expensive. It's, it's something for an Ivy League university to do, okay? To demonstrate it's possible. But there's also offsetting actions here, and, and what they're gonna do is try to do, reduce somebody else's carbon to offset the carbon that we can't stop emitting, okay? So that means that somewhere else, they're going to be emitting CO2 in a lower amount, but we're, we're trying to offset here. So it, it, it's a little bit hard for everybody in the U.S. to use the same approach to get down to zero in 2035, but really important, and I think it's great that Cornell is out front. Don't get me wrong. This is what we should be doing, is Cornell should be demonstrating how to do it. But it's still a really ambitious plan, and it's, it's going to be hard to achieve. So let's think about the U.S., okay? It's a very rich country, but it is a fossil fuel producing country, too. And we know that those pressures are really strong in the U.S. political system, for sure. So um, I think this same uh, slide was shown by uh, Bruce Bailey when he came in and talked about um, converting to sustainable energy or a version of this, and he cited this same study, this Jacobson et al. study. And this study argues that we can get rid of CO2 emissions from the power sector in the U.S. by 2050. However, not all the energy experts actually agree. There, there's been a lot of papers about energy conversion, and there's only this one paper that says we can do it this cheaply and this easily. Most power uh, experts agree that it's actually pretty hard to decarbonize the U.S., that it's going to take a lot of effort, and that was a very, let's say, optimistic study, and it's not necessarily going to be that easy. It could be economically and technically much more challenging than indicated. Um, and the problem is, is the wind and solar intermittency issues, right? Because you need power all the time. You need to know you have power all the time. And right, not just during the day when you have solar, and not just when it's windy when you have wind energy, OK? And you also uh, you can get rid of some of the intermittency if you have really good power transmission, OK? But we don't have really good power transmission. It's hard to move energy around the U.S. And you have to put them in those really big power lines. And people don't like really big power lines through their backyard. So, you, you know, you get nimbyism there, too. Nobody wants to have those big high power uh, lines coming through. Obama tried to expand those and ha ran into a lot of trouble. Um, if we had battery power, th that would work. And there's been a lot of improvements in that. It, you know, you just think of the Tesla battery and, and all those improvements. So, Things have really changed in the last few years. Wind and solar are so much cheaper. Batteries are so much cheaper. But it's still not clear we're going to get down by 2050 be able to go, OK? Um, it's, it's a little harder than they indicate in, in this paper, the Jacobson et al. paper. Um, politically, of course, yeah, it's really difficult to deal with transitions. I mean, there's people who are going to lose if we move away from coal, if we move away from natural gas. And those people don't want to lose their jobs. They don't want to lose their money, OK? And so then you have the political pressures to not um, move ahead. Even if you, could, you argue that they're going to have jobs somewhere else, I mean, that's, it's hard to transition. And so there's always going to be political resistance to transitioning. And you just think about how fast you're trying to transition here. This is really, really fast. So can the U.S. do it, right? I mean, what we've been talking about is really from the electricity sector, which is one of the easiest sectors to transform. The transportation sector, maybe you can move cars onto electric, but you have to do that. Can you really have electric uh, trucks moving everything? What about airplanes? You, you can't really have electric airplanes. Um, industry, some parts of industry are relatively easy, some parts are hard. Uh, agriculture is also uh, pretty tricky and, and not at all addressed by, by these other methods. Um, you know, what about the world? I mean, if it's so hard in the U.S. to achieve these really ambitious goals, what about the rest of the world? What about developing countries, okay? Um, what, how are they going to do it? Um, countries in Europe, for example, that uh, aren't fossil fuel producers that are already well on their way, it's, it's 
it's not so hard for them. You could think of some countries like Iceland. Do you know what Iceland's predominant uh, source of energy? Geothermal. They're sitting on a volcano. It's awesome, right? It's great. They're 95% carbon free or something like that. Wonderful. And France, what do they use? Nuclear. OK. <laughs> We could go that route. It'd be politically kind of hard for us here to go that route. But developing countries, it's even harder, right? They want to grow their GDP. They're, they're, some of them still have increasing population. And they want to be rich like us. Why don't they have the right to be rich like us? Don't they have the right to drive their car and have a big house you know, that emits all this CO2? What, you know, what, what about that? Um, what we hope is leapfrogging technologies, right? In, in some of these places, the there's no transmission lines, okay? So if you go straight to solar, win-win, okay? You, the solar panels are getting cheaper, and you don't have to put in transmission lines. It's, it's a more uh, dispersed way of getting energy. So some of this, you know, you really can do it. Um, and it can help with their, their energy security. And that just means that they're, they're producing their own energy. They're not waiting for some other country or paying some other country to get their fossil fuels. So it, it can work really well for uh, developing countries. But remember, they, they are still growing in population, and they want to grow their GDP, and they want to use the cheapest energy, just like we did. I mean, right? It was, fossil fuel is still, in many places, the cheapest energy. So it's, it's, it's not straightforward to try to stop uh, developing countries from using uh, CO2. Now, it's not only the energy sector. We, we, the predominant source of the CO2 going out to 2100 in a, in a business as usual does come from fossil fuel burning, for example, in the energy sector. But if we can cut that down using conversion to sustainable energies, which are getting more and more economically feasible, the movement to solar and wind and these batteries, you know, this is making it more and more possible. Well, that just means we have to address even better the um, emissions from deforestation and agriculture. I mean, you still have to feed those people, right? And if they want American diets with a lot of meat, you have to feed them even more, okay? So this conversion that we're doing, the transition to richer societies will probably mean more and more desire to have our kind of food. And it's, it, you know, that's part of our huge CO2 footprint from the US, is the way that we produce food and the, what we eat, that we eat uh, uh, heavily meat-based. So that is also a problem. So we need to also work on the agriculture and the deforestation sectors. So those are very, very tricky, in some ways maybe even trickier than energy, right? And, and not, I don't think there's a plan yet to get those emissions down as low as they need to, okay? It is now part of the Paris Agreement, it's called the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, a lot of acronyms, but it's now part of the whole plan to actually consider deforestation and agriculture when we move forward, and we really have to. I mean, to get to those really low targets, as you saw, we have to stop emitting everything, and so we have to also target these other sectors, and yet still feed people, okay? This is really important. Now, the other part that we have to do and that I want to talk some more about are these human carbon emissions, okay? And we need to be creating human carbon sinks by 2050, um, and we have to have them really widespread. They have to be widely deployed really soon, okay? And this carbon sink here, you know, it's the same size as our, almost as our carbon source now. So these carbon sinks would have to be as widely deployed as coal-fired and uh, natural gas-fired and oil-fired uh, you know, power plants and cars are now. Okay, just think of the scale that we have to reach in the next 50 years if we're going to keep to these low targets. Okay? Let's think about the, those technologies. How do we remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere? Do you guys uh, know about any of these technologies? What the most common one is? What, what some other ones are? What are some good ones? There's some studied here at Cornell. Anybody know? So the most common one that actually are used um, in these reports, uh, they, they, they um, 
in these integrated assessment models and the scenarios that you know Pat Reed and uh, Brian O'Neill talked about. The most commonly used one is is actually um, a, a bioenergy and carbon capture and sequestration here. But there's a lot of ways to remove carbon theoretically from the atmosphere. Good forestry, right? You stop tropical deforestation, stop all deforestation. You aforest in some places that can be beneficial. You reforest and you get wetlands back in place, okay? So it's really about changing the way we manage land to make it so that there's more carbon sinks. We can also change the way we do agriculture. There's a lot of potential in agriculture to try to take up more carbon. These technologies, kind of the natural carbon dioxide removal solutions, they tend to be less costly. Is there a question? Uh, so ocean acidification is, is a huge issue, especially, especially for calcifying organisms, i.e. corals, okay? So it, it is, um, some people call it the other CO2 problem because uh, it's, it's a, climate change is one issue with CO2, but ocean acidification is, a, is kind of a separate issue. In some ways they make each other worse, in some ways they make each other, they may offset each other in some places. But for the most part, it's a, it's a terrible issue, the ocean acidification issue. Um, it, 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 you know, uh, it's, not, it's not gonna solve our problem. It, it does mean that the CO2 in the atmosphere, about half of it is taken up by the land and the ocean relatively quickly, but about 30% of the CO2 we emit right now is gonna be in the atmosphere for the next 20,000 years. It's, um, uh, Peter Hess had a slide showing that. It, it's a really long time that the CO2 is in the atmosphere. And the reason is, is at first the ocean can act really well to take up the carbon, but because of the ocean chemistry and some other effects, it tends to slow down its uptake of carbon. So, you know, not, not a, it doesn't slow down enough to stop the ocean acidification problem, but as it gets more um, acidified, basically, it, it pulls it down less CO2. So th those are related issues, but a little bit separate. So these natural sinks for carbon that would remove the carbon are, are less costly. They're really close to deployment. They could be more vulnerable to reversal, but they also cannot do <laughs> the, the amount that we need done. Um, people don't think that, that you can easily suck down this amount a unless you have an area um, the, the size of uh, most of the Midwest dedicated and you're doing it optimally. It's, it's a huge amount of land you would need to draw down the, the, um, the CO2 into agriculture and then sequester it. We'll, we'll talk about that, but it's, you have to have a lot of area devoted to this. Now there's also some um, people working in the technological area and you can get storage into rocks and materials or you can do direct air capture and storage, CO2 mineralization or make products with it. So here's the, the bioenergy uh, with CCS, they put actually on the technological side because of the CCS, carbon capture and sequestration. And so you uh, collect all the CO2 that's coming out of the bioenergy. I have another slide on that here. What is BEX? Bioenergy, carbon capture, and sequestration, right? It's pretty much assumed in all the scenarios that can reach 1.5 or 2 degrees that anybody has shown you, including myself. Um, and what it is is you, you'll take some kind of feedstock, you, you know, agriculture residual or plants that you grew just for BEX. You bring it to a facility, you burn it, you produce energy, but then you take the resulting CO2 and you put it into the ground, into geologic storage, basically. Um, and the, they assume that the geologic storage is safe as well as uh, um, it'll stay there, okay? So there's a couple problems with the, with the, with the BEX. Um, one is how much land it would take, um, and not just land, but water as well. So people have shown that the land requirements to get that huge amount of CO2 out of the atmosphere that we need at the end of the century is a ton of land, it's a ton of water, that you would need, and um, it, you know, well, it could be done extremely poorly. This is kind of a paranoid slide about Bex here, I would say a little bit, um, but there is the issues about um, CCS pumping underground, uh, being pumped underground, and we don't know if it'll stay there, and then there's also issues about induced seismicity. If you've heard about in, uh, in Oklahoma, 
the induced seismicity from pumping things into the ground. We don't think it would happen with CCS, but we didn't think it was going to happen in Oklahoma either. Okay, so there's things about the system we don't understand very well. Um, and so even the, the CCS part of this might not work very well. But if you look at the cost of carbon removal, then um, you know, the afforestation is a relatively cheap way to do it, but it can't take up that much carbon. So this is cost on this uh, axis and how much you could remove over here. Um, then you have maybe producing some plastics, which um, there's uh, faculty here. Uh, uh, Jeff Coates over in the chemistry department produces a plastic from CO2, uh, for example. There's, uh, you can also make carbon negative cement. Usually cement produces carbon, but you can make carbon negative cement. Restore wetlands, soil management, biochar can take a lot. But to get the really large amounts, we would have to do some other techniques here. But you can see then the price. And then these prices are a little bit higher than right now the carbon tax is, because the carbon tax is zero right now. But, um, but these can be pretty expensive right now. But hey, the technology is being developed. And this is what we, we need here, is these kind of technologies. I would say right now there's a big revolution in carbon removal technologies. And um, uh, you can see that I'm not so optimistic about some of the pathways to uh, keeping climate change down, but I'm actually a very optimistic person. Um, and so uh, a lot of my hope lies with technology. Uh, we've had so much innovation in the sustainable energy sector and in wind and solar and batteries. Maybe that will continue and we'll be able to lower our targets. But I'm hoping for that same revolution in carbon removal. So this is just, I just was searching The Guardian, and these are all different technologies that they've highlighted just in this year, in the last three months. And again, there's a lot of work here at Cornell working in these same areas on um, forests, on agriculture, on new, new technologies to convert CO2 to fuels or CO2 to plastics that can be sold. And so there's a lot of new ways to move ahead on carbon removal. But recognize that, that we have to work on carbon removal if we want the lower targets. It's not just about moving to sustainable energy and sustainable agriculture. We have to work on these methods. So what can you do? What can I do? What can we all do? I mean, one is, and this is what we're going to have to do, is we're going to have to change our behavior. I mean, those, you saw that radical change in the CO2 emissions. I mean, we're, we're going to have to change what we expect to get out of every day, you know, how much we expect to uh, consume, because the consumption, a lot of it, is really what drives the CO2 emissions. So one, um, one example, there was a recent article, I just think just a couple days ago, in the New York Times about how to reduce your own carbon footprint. And you, you might want to look at that. I think they've got some really good examples there. Um, you can advocate and vote for more renewable energy. For example, in Ithaca, uh, we can actually decide that all of our energy, pay a little bit more, decide that all of our energy has to come from renewable sources in the hopes that that will switch, you know, uh, nice egg to more and more renewable in this region. And then, you know, you guys are our future. You can work to reduce emissions and work in the sustainable uh, renewable energies or in sustainable agriculture. Those are both super important areas for people to continue to work. Um, but I'd also say we need to be working on the carbon dioxide removal as well. And this is a new area, and I think that the, I'm hopeful that there's a lot of new places to go and, and innovate in technology. Um, you can advocate for a carbon tax. There actually was a little bit of a carbon tax in the, um, the bill signed by uh, uh, Trump and the Republican House and Senate. And it's, it's kind of a secret, don't tell them. But they actually put a little bit of a carbon tax in there for sequestration. Um, but let's advocate for more of that, and uh, there's some uh, uh, nonpartisan advocacy groups in D.C. trying to get both Republicans and Democrats on board with a uh, carbon tax. Um, but, you know, push New York, push uh, the, the whole country in this direction. And then you personally can work in, in the areas to help develop new technologies. So, you know, what it, what it comes back down to, you know, what, what is Cornell trying to do in these areas? And I'd say, you know, we're really trying to educate and get you guys to understand the problem of climate change. Um, and then we're cutting emissions in the climate action plan, so we're doing what we can. But uh, another area is the, the scientific, uh, the research and development going on here. So, 
uh, one of the things to consider is, you know, that climate change is not the only problem we face. And, um, you know, what, what other problems do you worry about in the world? Do you, do you only worry about climate change? I mean, no, we're in this climate change course, but what else do you worry about? What are you concerned about in the next 20 years? Hmm? Okay. Plastics. Pla other environmental issues? Plastics? Deforestation, biodiversity, a lot of environmental issues. What about non-environmental issues? Population explosion, yeah? Anything else? Yep. Automation. Automation, it's gonna change jobs. That's really true, yeah, it's very interesting. So I worry a lot about poverty in other countries. I worry about war, peace, things like that. And I think those things are related to each other. So, so there's a lot of issues to think about, not just climate change. Um, so you can see my fixation. I put a slide in on poverty. But um, it's, one thing that people, I don't think, recognize is actually how much progress we've made in fighting poverty in, in the world. Um, uh, so here's the, the population to 2015. And then the red, the, the blue, is the popu I'm sorry, the green is the population. If you're colorblind, this is a terrible slide. Um, th this line here is the number of people not, uh, this is the total number of people, so the green is the people not in extreme poverty, and the red is the number of people living in extreme poverty. So in the last 20 years, there's actually been a reduction in, in poverty. I'm not, not sure you realize that, but um, the, this uh, was documented as part of the millennium uh, development goals also, it was one of the efforts that occurred. So it, to me, this is great, you know, much less poverty in the world. This is a really important issue to me. Um, of course, did they need fossil fuels to get out of poverty, right? We've had this huge explosion in CO2 emissions as well. I mean, a lot of the people who got out of poverty, but not all, are actually in China, okay? It's a huge country and um, they moved a lot of people out of poverty. And so part of this trend is China, and China is now one of the biggest emitters of CO2. They're trying really hard to pass the US, but we're, we're trying to keep up with them. Um, so do you, do you need fossil fuel emissions to get out of poverty? I mean, that's, that's the problem, right? Um, so what, you know, other issues of freedom from conflict, no hunger, freedom from discrimination, justice, all these issues. And there's actually a set of goals to try to achieve these kind of broader goals. And these are called the Sustainable Development Goals, and they're supposed to be met by 2030. And so they're a follow-on from the Millennium Development Goals, which ended at 2000, which were thought to actually be somewhat successful. You know, usually people are surprised how much poverty has decreased um, in, over the last 20, 30 years. But it's actually true across the globe, poverty has decreased. Um, and now we have these new uh, goals, you know, no poverty, no hunger, good health, education equality, gender equality, clean water, renewable energy, good jobs, infrastructure, reduced inequalities within societies and across societies, sustainable cities, responsible consumption, climate action, it's also there. We've got some biodiversity underwater, biodiversity on land, peace and justice. And then the partnerships, making sure that there's a, a, you know, international partnerships here. So these are the sustainable development goals. And, you know, as part of the report I'm on, we're supposed to consider sustainable development and the sustainable development goals, really, as one aspect of that. Part of thinking about these goals, it, it really comes down to thinking about climate justice. And um, we're going to have a speaker, is it next week or the week after? I'm not sure. Next week talking about uh, um, at least intergenerational equity issues. Um, but I want to introduce some of these concepts because these concepts are really, really important and really interesting and not always intuitively obvious. So climate justice, just as a definition, it, you know, from the name, it's, it's relating climate change to the concepts of justice from, say, environmental and social justice. And the fundamental proposition of climate justice is that those who are the least responsible for climate change the poor or people from poor countries, I mean, it's the rich like us who are emitting all the CO2, are the, 
we're the most responsible and we're gonna not suffer as much as the people who aren't emitting all the CO2. I mean, the impacts almost always are harder on the poor within a society, that's where environmental justice comes in, um, and the poor in other countries. I mean, the impacts uh, of climate change actually at our latitude here in mid-latitudes, uh, we'll see a little bit of an increase in precipitation and it's not so bad to us if we get an increase in temperature, right? If we, especially if it's a winter temperature. Anyway, but, and we'll see an increase in precipitation, but you go farther south and they're gonna see a decrease in precipitation and higher temperatures when they already have high enough temperatures, okay? So there's an asymmetry in the impacts from climate change and it makes it so that the, the um, impacts tend to be more intense in low latitudes, but also, you know, richer countries have the resources to deal with it much better, okay? Now Katrina, kind of showed that even within a society, there was a lot more damage to poor people in the, from Katrina, the Hurricane Katrina, than there was to the rich people who got out of uh, um, New Orleans much faster. So even within our society, you see this injustice associated with these kind of extreme weather events. So, there's a bunch of different ways that climate justice plays into this. Um, the rich benefit from the CO2 emissions, this is how you know, we got cheap energy, this is why we can be in this nice room here. Um, and the poor tend to experience more of the impacts. They're less able to move out of the regions that are impacted, things like that. Like I said, the high and mid-latitude countries, which happen to emit more CO2, get the benefits of emitting. It's warmer, it's nicer. There, there's actually gonna be an increase in growing season up in Canada and Russia. They don't mind climate change, right? Um, I mean, they, they all, there are also some bad impacts there too, but it generally, they benefit more, whereas arid regions, coastal regions, they're gonna bear the cost. Okay. The other thing is the inter, intergenerational equity, that people today are emitting CO2 that future generations have to deal with, right? And, and that's fundamentally unfair, but the speaker next week will talk about that more. But there's some subtleties here too, and I see Ravi Cumber um, talked about this last year. Um, if the current trends continue, actually future generations are gonna have fewer poor people than today. Poverty levels will continue to go down, hopefully. That's my goal. Now heavy mitigation today is gonna cost a bundle today, okay? And that, that might be money that that the poor don't get to have, okay, for development. So the poor today might bear a burden on that heavy mitigation today, right now. They're already suffering and they're gonna lose their jobs on top of it. But heavy mitigation right today is not gonna help us today. It's not gonna help those poor people today. It's not gonna help till 2040, okay? The CO2 that we're gonna, remember the very first slide, I talked about this, that this, business as usual, and this trajectory, this blue line here, which is a radical transformation of our society. Everybody turns vegan in this blue line, by the way, okay, as one example. Um, so radical restructuring of our economies. We don't even see the difference, really, and for 30 years, certainly not in temperatures, okay? So the poor today are not gonna, not gonna feel the benefits of this heavy mitigation. They're only gonna feel the cost. So if you think, for example, the US budget, some of it goes into research and mitigation, carbon dioxide removal, and some of it goes to developing countries to help them develop, okay? So if all of a sudden we use all that money for mitigation, that's less money going to developing countries. You can, you can just think that in the US. But it's also then if you don't let developing countries have the fossil fuels to develop, I mean, first of all, it's gonna be hard to stop them, okay? It's not really fair to stop them. I, I mean, they, they wanna develop. Don't they have the right to develop just like us? I mean, this is, this is a huge climate justice issue. And so here I am, uh, you know, I, a person, I, I really care about the environment. I care about climate change, but I also care about poor people in other countries. And I don't know what we should do. I mean, this is really hard because we might have to decide too. This is, this is a really important problem and it, it doesn't have one answer. It's, it's very much a value judgment. So the problem is, is the poor today are gonna suffer for, for future rich people, right? That, there's, a, there's an inequity there as well, potentially. So one of the things um, that uh, 
the, the literature is trying to do right now is to think about whether we can meet the sustainable development goals, let lesser developed countries develop and uh, have a, a more affluent lifestyle with all the capacity building, the education that we have here, as well as cutting the CO2 emissions. Is there a path forward there? And so there's a lot of emphasis on trying to figure out how to do that. And we, we've talked about it, you know, a uh, lot of places don't have energy right now. Well, if you can get them to not use fossil fuel, but rather to, it's called leapfrogging technologies, go straight to the solar, right? Go to the wind energy. Um, then, then they don't have to emit CO2, but they can still get energy access, okay? So there's a lot of ways to try to meet the sustainable development goals or sustainable development as well as meet the climate goals. Um, so I guess my, my bottom line is, yes, we, we can do this. I want to I wanna do a couple ads, and then I'll come back to my solution. One is we do have a climate change minor, and this class is one of the requirements for it, so you've already fulfilled it. Um, and I'd like to encourage you to sign up for more classes on climate change. On, on the climate change minor website, we list all the classes that have a lot of climate change. So even if you don't want the minor, please go check out the classes. Um, and then I was also emailed this, volunteer to build roof, roof trusses for local homes, okay? So help some people here locally um, uh, to have a better house, my advertisement. So I would argue that we may not be able to avoid all the consequences of climate change, but hopefully we can avoid the worst. And the Paris Agreement is the first step there. It's not, it's not enough. We need a lot more action. Um, but we need to do that in a way that allows for sustainable development. So thinking about pathways that allow us to get these multiple goals at the same time. It's really complicated, it's really hard, but I think that's what we have to do. Thank you. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah. So the question is uh, that China and India, you read about China and India not doing very much. Uh, I'm not sure that that's true anymore. Actually, China is probably doing more than the US on the renewable energy side. Um, China has, just in the last year or two, admitted that they have terrible air quality and that it's really costly to them. And so they're trying to move off coal. And they actually, this winter, they banned residential coal use for heating, which they didn't have enough gas. Residential coal use is, is terrible because uh, it caused smog. Like the London smog event in 1952 that killed you know, 3,000 people, 4,000 people, and made it so that London banned all residential coal use um, to heat your house. It, it's terrible because it emits all this black a carbon that gets in your lungs and kills people. Um, so China's trying to do that right now. Um, now they had to back off because people didn't have access to gas and it got really cold. But they, they're really trying to address the air quality concerns of it. Um, and with that, then moving to uh, technologies that will be emitting less CO2. And they, they claim they're not going to have any more cars that are internal combustion engines really soon. I mean, they're making all sorts of claims. And the one thing about a totalitarian government is they can actually jam things through. So, you know, I'm not going to say it's a good thing, but some, sometimes they might be able to reach some of these goals. So China is making a lot of noise that they're the leader on this issue uh, since the U.S. has backed off that. India is a democracy like the U.S., so it has more issues trying to address. And I think people are pretty disappointed at, with what the government is doing there right now. They're not doing as much as they could. And their air quality is now worse than China's, which is an achievement. Um, and so they really need to be addressing it for the air quality issues. I mean, people die all the time from bad air quality in both China and India. And um, so trying to address that issue is a, it is a really high profile issue that is so linked to getting into sustainable energy. So they're moving, maybe not as fast as we might want, but China's moving faster than we are. So I guess, yeah. Anyone else? Questions? Oh. Hang on. Thanks, Mike. Um, so this is from Callie in Colombia. 
Um, I was wondering if any thought has been given to the need for overcompensating in bringing CO2 down, given how much denialism there is. Huh. So the question is whether uh, worrying about overcompensating. So I'm just worried about getting anywhere close down personally and um, getting the, the technologies and the political will in place to, to keep decreasing it back down. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, there is an issue if you exaggerate things, then the denialists get stronger. So I, I think it's really good to just be honest about what we know and what we don't know and set the targets in a realistic way. I don't, I don't think personally that fear is a good way to motivate people. You can tell I'm optimistic. I think we should really try to move forward in a way that uh, makes uh, sense as much as possible economically and environmentally across the board. Any other questions? Uh, can you talk about uh, potential enforcement mechanisms for Paris and whether that's a discussion that's being had? Well, so it's voluntary contribution. So, uh, so the the next. COP, Conference of Parties, the follow-up to Paris will be a, it's called a global stock tape. And so all the countries are going to come back and try to uh, have better estimates of where they're at, and then the scientists will too. Um, so a lot, so let's just say some of the countries for the Paris Agreement overestimated their CO2 so that they could really quickly cut them back. Um, this is what people do. Um, so all of a sudden, you know, you'll have a country, and then it jumped up, and then their projection is, is down. So um, people are identifying those countries and try to work with those countries to make it so it's a little more transparent. But it, I mean, they're voluntary uh, contributions, and you really you, you have to get countries buy-in. Um, and there's a lot of work, as you know, you know, at the Conference of Parties, they're really working on making it so that uh, the rules are really clear on uh, how you make the calculations, how you show that you've made you know, the progress and things like that. So there's a lot of efforts right now in terms of improving uh, the transparency, as I said. So Selena went to the COP last year, to, um, and, and so did I, so I know she was there. Um, and so we uh, learned a lot about these issues that are being negotiated every year. So. Any other questions? Thank you. No, just a follow up. I mean, uh, for the voluntary uh, reductions, I mean, that needs a lot of funding. And there's a lot of many countries. So who, who is going to fund and where is the funding coming from? Right. So uh, as, as Erica pointed out, there is a lot of money that's required. And there are certain countries who have a lot more money and have burned a lot more CO2. Um, and other countries, you know, who, who should pay for that? Um, uh, there's kind of a framework to think about climate change that, it, that I think comes from a Henry Hsu is that, you know, what level should we go for? How, how much is that going to cost? Um, who should do it? Who should take the action? And the third point is who should pay for the action, okay? And, and those don't have to be the same people. And some of this is, is granted by the richer countries, and they're, they're, they're trying to set up the Global Climate Fund, for example, the Global Environment Fund. And these things really have to be set up in order to make it so the resources are there for the technology transfer, so the developing countries can do this leapfrogging that we really need them to do. So there, uh, there are mechanisms in place, but they're not sufficient at this point, and they're not being funded. So. We have another online question. Um, I appreciate what we can do, or what, I appreciate the what we can do focus that goes beyond just individual consumer habits. For example, the recent New York Times piece you referenced was really just that. But what do you think of divestment campaigns, which Cornell has decided not to do? Ooh, I think that's really interesting, and I haven't personally studied that problem, although I understand that the discussion class just had a whole discussion about that that's associated with this. Um, I, so I don't, I don't know enough about it. I think it's a really interesting um, proposal. And I'll leave it at that. Yeah, Michael. Michael. 
So in a timeline where the U.S. Uh, continues to not, or at least the U.S. government does not uh, continue being a part of the Paris Agreement, uh, what country or countries do you think will step up to be the leaders for uh, keeping this going? Right, well, I didn't really talk about this, but one thing we, we know already and we really saw when we were at the COP last year is the uh, sub-national level action. I, I love these words, right? And that means the state level action, the university level action, the city level action. And so even though the federal government in the United States has not been supportive of the Paris Agreement, uh, um, there's a lot of people in the U.S. who are supportive and are going to try to meet those goals, right? Cornell is one of them, for example. New York is one of them. California is one of them. And so we actually saw a lot of talks about uh, subnational um, investment in the, in the Paris Agreement, and you're going to see that, I think, more and more, uh, and people trying to crank down. You know, uh, New York is not a fossil fuel-producing state anymore, right? And so California isn't either. So the states have different interests in the US. And so they may crank down their CO2 emissions much faster. And these are big, rich states. And I think they could drive a lot of this. So you shouldn't be too discouraged by what's going on at the national level. Because I think what's going on at the state level, at the city level, at Cornell, it, it, it could very well turn the tide. Now, I have to admit I am an optimist. But I think we have to be optimistic and, and try to keep moving towards our goals and not give up. One of the speakers we had talked about using engineering methods to block solar radiation, such as creating clouds. What are your thoughts on methods like that? So Doug McMartin presented uh, solar radiation management. And uh, the main method he, that people talk about is actually you know, trying to mimic volcanoes um, and put, emitting volcanoes into that uh, stratosphere. But it, you know, it's really like a volcano. You know, every couple of days if you really want to offset some of those huge emissions. Um, it's extremely controversial um, to, to even to talk about it. In, um, in my field, uh, a lot of people think it's, you know, it, it's too soon. That the main thing, and Doug admits this, that you, you shouldn't do solar radiation management until you have technologies in place that will remove the carbon, okay? And so you have to have those technologies. Otherwise, you're just going to you know, keep having the CO2 come up, go up, and you're going to have to keep increasing how much you put in the atmosphere. So we can't use solar radiation management, I would argue, until we have technologies that are starting to be used widespread on carbon dioxide removal. And, and then I, I'll, I'll think about it at, at that point. But the, the problem is, and um, I mean, uh, Doug McMartin actually went in and testified in front of Congress. Um, and he showed some photos there, but the, you know, some of the Republican congressmen he was testifying in front of said, oh, well, we can just do this instead of mitigating. Instead of, uh, and they, they weren't even thinking of carbon dioxide removal. Okay, we'll just do this instead. So that's the problem, is that there's too many people who think we can do this cheap option, because solar radiation management, these vol fake volcanoes are relatively cheap, we could do this instead of mitigating. It's great, you know. It's just that we're committing the next, you know, 20,000 year <laughs> uh, people to a huge amount of solar radiation management. It's just not clear that it, it would work. So that's my kind of response to that. Okay. So. Um, First question online is, uh, wouldn't there be adaptation challenges for the natural environment, even at latitudes that wouldn't mind a little bit of warming? I'm sorry, say it again. Wouldn't there be adaptation challenges for the natural environment, even at latitudes that wouldn't mind a little bit more warming? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the impacts at high and mid-latitudes are, are much less than in some regions, but some of the impacts are much less. But, but what you see um, in, in the high latitudes is, is the, the melting of, of permafrost, basically. And, and uh, in, in a lot of these regions, you know, permafrost is permanently frozen stuff. And as soon as it melts, then the land gets all funky, and your roads are destroyed, and your houses are destroyed, and you can't move around. I mean, there's huge adaptation risks associated with warming, even at high latitudes, where you're going to see a lot of warming, but you know, one might think warming would be better, right? So you, you see a lot of impacts. And then, of course, sea level rise uh, would be 
um, more in some places and less in others, but it's going to be you know, really hard for all cities to, to take. So uh, anybody who lives on the coast, which a lot of people like to live on the coast, is going to suffer from sea level rise. So even in the places least affected, there, there's going to be a lot of impacts. And um, what negative emission technology that is still in research do you find most promising? Ooh, that's such a good question. I'm, I'm super hopeful about the technologies that are, uh, take the CO2 and make either fuels or plastics. Um, but you know, I, I don't know what, what the best technologies are there. The, the algal bioenergy, you know, that's, I guess that's a sustainable energy, but that, that is super cool also. There's so many different ways forward on that. And, and you know, it's really hard to know which one's going to win, too. And, and hopefully multiple ones will win. So I, I think there's a lot of possibility. And I don't know which ones are the most possible. Michael again. Hello again. Um, so you were talking about some of the advancements, including the creation of plastics from new materials such as uh, either um, biological materials or through carbon dioxide itself. Um, how would the use and then eventual disposal of these go about? If you're making something a plastic out of CO2, how would you properly dispose of it? Yeah, yeah these are really good questions, right? Is that permanent sequestration and you put it in a plastic? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um, I guess I think it's better than you know, taking out uh, some oils and processing it, but uh, I'm not sure. One more, okay. Could you comment on the importance of engaging in the political process in this country to bring about the change we need, uh, AKA voting? <laughs> Voting's the best way to get anything done, um, and, but I think some of the advocacy uh, that people are doing is, is really, really important. But in the end, you know, you got to vote. And you, you got to get out there and make sure your opinion's heard. So that's super important for climate change policy. Can you tell us a little bit about what it, how you do your work on the IPCC? Like, do you get students to do a literature review to find all the published papers? Or do you do that yourself? Or you divvy it up among all the s scientists? How do you do that? Um, so I've done it um, mostly postdocs working with me have, have been doing that, the help on that. But um, uh, we, it, it's, uh, it's a lot of, uh, of reading the literature that that's, can be very technical is the problem. Um, but it's, it's really interesting stuff, especially on this report, all sorts of things that I haven't really thought about. You know, I'm really about climate change feedbacks, and I use these big models to try to figure out what the projections look like under different conditions. And I'm working with all these social scientists, you know, who go in to different regions and, you know, cities and give surveys to people about what the impacts are in those regions and things like that. So, yeah, you know, one of my uh, coordinating lead authors is uh, going to come and speak in three weeks, two weeks here, um, Bill Selesky. So he's one of the people that I uh, talk to a lot at, at these meetings. So it's, it's very cross-disciplinary and, and very interesting in that way.